when I started writing, I was writing a lot of sort of very internal, very dreamlike stories. I was powering my <coughs> writing with my own subconscious, and everything was very, uh, very personal and very insular. I would make these worlds, and I could control every single thing that was in them. Um, I knew when I made um, uh, when I made a world, when I began a story in a new setting, that um, it contained exactly what I put into it and nothing more. And it was sort of a wonderful sense of control that I had um, from doing that. But I also began to question why I was writing that way and um, realized that I wanted to engage with the world a little bit more because there are so many things I did in my everyday life. Um, going to the grocery store, putting on makeup, um, uh, calling someone on the phone or ignoring a call from someone on the phone that seemed to have emotional significance. Um, and I began to question why I was excluding them from my writing. Um, why was there this, um, this category of uh, life events that were significant and worthy of literature and these that weren't? So in some ways, this was my attempt to write a realist novel, and it turned out very strangely, <laughs> um, as you'll see. Uh, I think that it take, took me a long time to get comfortable with the term realism because it always meant to me one type of story, like a, a person who was built a certain way with this biography and this sort of um, occupation and these sorts of interests and this demographic profile made for a person and I didn't relate to that fully. Um, but then I sort of started to think that uh, Reality is actually much stranger than we give it credit for, I think. Um, <laughs> the way that we love our lives nowadays with um, you know, access to anyone in the world, um, when we want them, if we want them, uh, the ability to distribute images of ourselves all over the internet, to send them to our relatives far away, to send them instantly, to send video, to stream video live um, through Periscope. Like, all of these things are very strange and I think they distort the body and the experience of the body and the experience of yourself in interesting ways. So um, I hope that this has managed to be a novel about the real world and also that it's managed to convey how strange I think the real world is. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm just going to read from the beginning in one stretch. So, page one. <laughs> Is it true that we are more or less the same on the inside? I don't mean psychologically. I'm thinking of the vital organs, the stomach, heart, lungs, liver, of their placement and function, and the way that a surgeon making the cut thinks not of my body in particular, but of a general body depicted in cross-section on some page of a medical school textbook. The heart from my body could be lifted and placed in yours, and this portion of myself that I had incubated would live on pushing foreign blood through foreign channels. In the right container, it might never know the difference. At night, I lie in bed, and though I can't touch it or hold it in my hand, I feel my heart moving inside me, too small to fill the chest of an adult man, too large for the chest of a child. There was a newspaper article about a man in Russia who had been coughing up blood. An x-ray showed a mass in his chest with a spreading shape, rag-edged. They thought it was cancer, but when they opened him up, they found a six-inch fir tree embedded in his left lung. Inside a body, there is no light. A mass wetness pressing in on itself, shapes thrust against each other with no sense of where they are. They break in the crowding, come and made. You put your hand to your stomach and press into the softness, trying to listen with your fingers for what's gone wrong. Anything could be inside. It's no surprise, then, that we care most for our surfaces. They alone distinguish us from one another and are so fragile, the thickness of paper. I was standing in my room in front of the mirror, peeling an orange. I cradled its exact weight in my palm, sinking a nail through the topmost layer. I dug a finger under its skin until I felt cool flesh, then I rooted that finger around and around. The rind tore with a soft, cottony sound, the peel one smooth, blunt piece trailing off the fist of the fruit. I slipped my contacts in and blinked at the mirror. 
Most mornings I barely resembled myself. It was like waking up with a stranger. When I caught a glimpse of my body, tangled and pale, it felt as if there were an intruder in my room. But as I dressed and put on makeup, touched the little tinted liquids to my skin, and watched the hand in the mirror move alongside my own, I rebuilt my connection to the face that I took outside and pointed at those around me. My hand ripped a wad of pulp and pushed it through the space between my lips. Juice crawled down the side of my palm. It was summer, and the heat hadn't yet tightened around our bodies, making us sticky and moist, trapping us in a suit we hated to wear. A breeze pushed through the open window, smelling of cut grass, flowers, and I could hear the people outside leaving their homes. The car doors opened and closed, tires shifting gravel as they pulled out their driveway and vanished for eight or nine hours, only to return less crisp, their unbuttoned cuffs hanging open. I liked letting noise from the neighborhood leak into my sleep and began turning things real. I liked it, except when I hated it, hated how close the houses were to each other, Hated that the first outdoor thing I sighted each morning was my landlady's swollen face as she poked her head out the door to grab the newspaper. She lived below us, but from certain angles, she could see straight up into her unit. Every day, she bent down to retrieve the paper and turned around, training her neck to peer in through the bedroom window, checking to see if I'd spent the night in my room. Her changing hairstyle, auburn one week, and then a dirty highlighted blonde the next, made it unclear whether she wore real hair or wore a rig, and if it was a wig, whether she slept with it on. My roommate B said it was like she was a fugitive inside her own home, someone living on the run without going anywhere at all. Across the street, there was a family with a dog that slept most of the day, but a few times each afternoon, it ran to throw itself the front window, smashing its muzzle against the glass and barking until the sounds it made warped and horizoned. I get up from my desk to see what was going on, but there was never anything to see, not even a squirrel. Sometimes then our eyes would meet, the dog and me, and we just stare at each other from across that street, not knowing what to do. It was a safe neighborhood. There was nothing you could complain about without sounding crazy. The sun was bright outside and I heard birds hidden in the trees, swarming the bushes with sounds of movement, calling out, bending small branches beneath the weight of their small bodies. Thumping sounds came from the other side of the bedroom door. It was Bee moving around our apartment, one small thump from the living room and another, and then the sound of something being dragged across the floor. I heard her going to start the coffee maker and then giving up, opening the refrigerator and giving that up too. Standing still in the middle of my room, I tried to gauge how much I could move without letting her know that I was alive. She couldn't assume that I'd be conscious this early, but that wouldn't stop her from checking every five or ten minutes, pausing to listen. Then sometimes she'd sit herself near the door, ear against the door jam, and talk toward me as though we were having a conversation. She'd talk until I responded. B said the apartment was lonely when I wasn't awake. She said if I was sleeping, I was as good as dead. She meant in terms of companionship, interactivity, my ability to help her make breakfast for herself. When B did eat, which was not always, she preferred to touch the food as little as possible to keep her hands clear of what she called that edible smell. She needed my hands to cut, to squeeze, to handle, to break eggs and toss their slimy shells into the garbage. From the hallway outside my bedroom, her mouth close to the sliver of space between door and molding, B spoke. I wanted to make us some coffee, but we're all out. I need your help to figure out what kind of juice I should drink. Have you ever had one of those moles that sticks out? I had a dream last night that we were both birds with their wings missing, but we helped each other escape from the box. When we escaped, we were so happy we wanted to celebrate, but we couldn't show it. We didn't have limbs. The summer I found out about the food chain, I was eight years old. I became obsessed with it in a way that made me outgoing explaining it to any adult or child who would listen. I drew maps of predator-prey relations on all my binders and notebooks, big webs in which I was always pictured in some topmost corner near all of my favorite foods. I told my parents that I was going to become an ecologist so I could find out which animals living in entirely different continents or habitats, on land or in water or caves, could eat each other if put in the same place. 
I would fill in the gaps, and every animal would be linked to every other by a one-way arrow leading from the prey to the mouth of its predator. It was an orderly system, like rainwater becoming seawater that dissolves again into little droplets of rain. It was a meat cycle, and that when I ate spaghetti with meatballs or chicken noodle soup for dinner, I went to bed certain that participating in the meat economy meant that I would be eaten too someday by something larger than me, or maybe by many things much smaller. That fall, we moved to a new school district 45 minutes from our old house, and our new neighborhood was greener and wetter than the last one, with more space between the houses. Everyone was a stranger, and in the afternoons, I'd go out into the woods behind our house and upend rocks and logs to see what was underneath. Underneath, there was a basement smell, and the wood, blackly wet, had a softer texture like damp velvet. I'd flip the log over and watch what was underneath scatter. Black beetles with a shellac to their hard casings, ants of different shades of brown and red, earthworms and shortened white worms. With a twig or a long blade of stiff grass, I prodded at them, rolling the worms in the rich dirt, herding a beetle over to a dark divot into which large black ants disappeared. I tried to feed the small insects to the larger ones. I wanted them all to mix, to struggle, to show me in real time what it meant to live and die. I found an earthworm half submerged in watery soil where it was being eaten by a larval dragonfly. The room was, worm was larger and stronger, its body a single muscle twisting out of the water and flopping back. It struggled, pulling its long body into small arcs and spirals. And this meant nothing to the larva that worked calmly to chew a hole into one of its ends. I left my room and went into the kitchen where B sat looking at the fridge. I don't know what I feel like eating, she said to me. Maybe you want a sandwich, I suggested. I can make you a sandwich. <clears throat> the sandwiches I made B were white bread, condiments, deli cheese, no meat. B claimed meat was hard to digest, but I think she just didn't want the calories inside her. Instead of cutting off the crusts, I squished the sandwich down with my palm to make of it a sort of edible coaster. This was a way of tricking her into thinking there was less food in it. Then I slid it on the plate, cut it diagonally, and handed it over. I'd make my own sandwich while, out of the corner of my eye, I watched her pull it apart, remove the cheese, scrape out the fat white center of the bread, and throw it away, leaving only the mayonnaise crust to chew on. No, too much, she said. I don't want to overeat when it's so hot out. What were you going to have? A sandwich, I said. Bee stared straight forward, chewing on her lip as she thought it through. Finally, she announced, let's have popsicles. Popsicles came in a 50 pack and were bright with artificial coloring, but there were only three flavors, red, pink, and orange. B loved them, the stuff that was more like a color than a food. Loved to eat them day or night as she drank the lemon-scented vodka from the freezer. Since she had moved in, I had been eating more popsicles and less of everything else. Her habits were contagious. I can only guess at how many boxes she went through from the plastic cups full of popsicle sticks, cigarettes, and sunset-colored liquid that I found in the living room. One time I asked her why she ate so many of these when she wouldn't even eat a scoop of ice cream. She brought the box and explained that even though they tasted like juice, they were made of something better. Each popsicle contained about 15 calories, and you could burn almost that many just by eating them with vigor. They erased themselves from your body, she said. B came from the kitchen and handed me a popsicle. We crawled out the window onto the roof the way we were used to and sat there with the summer heat pressing down on our arms and legs from above. Our popsicles were identical orange and each was a conjoined twin bound in the center with sticks projecting from both halves. A navel orange is something similar. The navel and other separate fruit attempting to grow within the base of the first impacted on all sides. The fruits are seedless, and new plants grow only through cutting and grafting, which means that all are essentially clones of one another. <coughs> I had just maneuvered myself over to the spot on the roof where I like to sit, where I could see into my room, and also into the kitchen next door and the living room across the street where they had the crazy dog. Bee had already stripped hers down and was digging in, biting in at first, and then holding its peak in her mouth to soften. Sucking sounds came from her mouth as the orange slick pulled around her teeth. She was working at it as though she hadn't eaten for days. 
I looked over at the house across the street and tried to spot the dog as I tore my popsicle wrapper, gummy on the inside from popsicle juice, juice coloring my hands as I tried to pull the popsicle from its skin. A bright heat trembled all around us as we ate them, our faces sheening with sweat. Sounds of lawnmowers and birds hung like chains in the quiet air. <coughs> I favored one side of the popsicle over the other so I could finish it first. Sweat da ran down my forehead and into my eye. Then there was the sound of an engine growing louder, harsh in the heavy afternoon, and we saw the neighbor's car coming slowly up the street. The man was driving, and his wife and daughter were in the car, too. B stopped looking to watch the car pull into the driveway, and when she looked down again and noticed her popsicle dripping, she crawled all over the roof looking for ants to drown in the sticky syrup. She hunched over them, dangling the last nub of it above, turning the stick in her fingers to make it drip more evenly. The ants struggled for a bit, and when they had stopped, others came to feed minusculely on the orange slick. I shuffled over on my knees to see them more closely, the dying ones and the ones not yet dying, many trying to eat at the stuff that had killed the others. The live ants looked they might, like they might be distressed or maybe just excited. I wanted to know which. I hung close above one group, casting my shadow over their swarming, and then waited to see some sign that would tell me whether they were caring for one another or just eating. Bee had lost interest in the ants, but she was watching me now with some intensity. What are you doing? she asked. The ants, I said. They're dying. Then I thought some of them were coming to help, but actually I think they're trying to eat the syrup. It's kind of morbid, said B. I don't understand why you try to kill them, I said. They never come into the house, but when you kill them this way, it leaves sticky spots all over the roof. We'll have to clean it someday. They die in sugar, she replied matter-of-factly. It's the best possible death for an ant. A strange noise came from nearby, and we both stood up to see better. From the house across the street, with the expensive-looking hydrangeas and the novelty mailbox shaped like a barn, the house where they had the crazy dog and the daughter who took ballet lessons on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday, three figures were following out through the front door. Each one wore a large, plain white sheet over its body, with holes cut out where the eyes would be. The largest figure helped the second largest down the front steps, while the smallest struggled out on its own, stepping all over the dragon corners of its oversized veil. Bee and I watched her neighbors shuffle in sheets toward the family sedan. The husband opened the passenger side door for the wife and walked all the way around the car to open the driver's side rear for the little girl, tiny under her white covering. Then he walked back up the front steps and into the house. We watched the door for what must have been a long time. Birds fought in the dark interior of the bushes over things we did not understand. The smaller body fidgeted in the back seat of the sedan. <clears throat> the father returned, carrying an aerosol can that turned out to be spray paint, cherry red. He stood in front of the garage door and in large, sagging block letters he spelled out, He who sits next to me, may we eat as one. The ghost man looked down at his can of spray paint like someone wondering whether he had just done it all correctly. Then he set it down in the driveway and got into the car. There was the sound of the engine starting up, the tires grinding against stray rocks, and then they were gone. They had left the front door open. So that's a chapter where a lot of the different modes that are being used get set in motion. Um, the storyline between uh, a, my narrator, and her roommate, B, who slowly grow to resemble one another more and more as the story goes on. Um, this candy line, candy cake sort of plot that goes on. Um, uh, wily Coyote or Trix Rabbit sort of mascot who ends up um, becoming very significant to our narrator. Um, and then the sort of force of uh, something strange that's going on in the world, this cult that's starting, that's drawing people out of their homes into some place far off that we get to eventually. <laughs> um, it's sort of like all the seeds are there, and if I jumped in later on, there'd be, there might be stock, but no roots, I guess. But um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Or? How, how much of it, uh, the way that the, the, the core style you used came out sort of fully formed after thinking about it, how much did you discover as you wrote it? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like 
when you go into writing something, there's a moment at the beginning where you uh, get to make conscious decisions and you think like, um, is first person more intimate for the reader? Is third person more intimate for the reader? Can we see more if I use a third person narrator? Um, can I move between characters? But um, here I knew that I really wanted the reader to be sort of stuck in one person's position and that um, their sort of lens was going to be the limit of the world as far as we could see. Um, things I discovered as I was writing were um, uh, things like uh, how much there was going to be in the present versus how much there was going to be in the past. Like, um, I thought that it would be interesting to make a character with a really shallow past, you know, because um, uh, going back into a character's life is a big part of how we um, explain their actions, right? So, like, um, in, in a book, uh, if a character leaves um, her husband, then we have a flashback to um, her father leaving her mother when she was a child or something like that. And there's a resemblance there, um, but I also think that it sometimes explains things too tidily. So um, I wanted you to be there with the character and her sort of frustration and irritation with her situation, um, feeling the desire for something else and uh, doing it all sort of in the present, um, uh, in a world kind of without history. Yeah. Did you have a creative inspiration or idea that uh, gave you an incentive to write this book? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think the first part uh, is what I was talking about, like about pushing against myself, you know, um, pushing against the style that I was used to writing in and trying to write something that took place in a world with all of the objects in it and patterns in it that um, went along with my life. But another was... Um, this question of, uh, I've always been fascinated by missing person stories. So um, whenever you see a news article about a person who's gone missing, and um, even if you think about that story for a long time, you never get to see the ending of it You know, while your mind's still on it. You forget about it, and in very rare cases, that person pops up again, and you see the end. But mostly it's just these stories that sort of pop up and then slip out of view. Um, so I was wondering what happens inside that missing person story, you know, um, we never get to hear them told from the inside, and what, what would it be like to tell one where the person goes missing partway through, but you get to go on that journey with them. Um, so I think that this sense, um, you know, uh, I don't know about here, but in America, right, if you want something from Target, <laughs> you can... Um, go to their website and check to see which stores across a whole vast area have it. Like, in some ways it feels like every single thing is very locatable. Um, and yet at the same time, people go missing, things go missing, um, planes go missing occasionally, which is incredibly frightening. <laughs> um, but uh, the world feels so steady and so safe. And at the same time, there are things that slip out of its view. And I'm fascinated by that. May I ask you how long it took you to write that book? I'd say um, I wrote it for two and a half or three years on the first sort of draft and then another six months revising it. So three and a half years, I guess. <laughs> um, it, it seems like a lot, but it all went by pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Stylistically speaking, who were you inspired by? I do think that uh, I love um, The Crying of Law 49. It is this like slim little puzzle of a book. And like uh, it's uh, it's dense like a lot of his other writing, but it's also so short that you can read it several times over um, and keep trying to, uh, you know, find the clues that you missed the first time and then notice these swaths of, of just total unknowability that are there too. Um, so I love that book as an example of how much mystery you can pack into a very small space. Okay. Yeah.
Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you for having me.